Eight. All right, welcome to, I think it's session eight, isn't it, of uh, CSE 103. This will be our politically incorrect uh, sessions on the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, Nazism, because of the evolution theory. We've got several things, lots, too much to discuss tonight than we'll ever get through. Tonight we're going to start talking about how evolution is the foundation philosophy for Nazism. Hitler uh, came to power because of American financiers' help. They wanted a, a war, they wanted an enemy, and Bill Still, I didn't have Bill Still's other book here, The Money Masters, but he also wrote this one, uh, On the Horns of the Beast, about the Federal Reserve. Bill Still wrote a book called The Money Masters, where he describes in great detail how Hitler uh, was given the money to come to power through the American bankers to help him rise to power to create another war, because who wins every war? The bankers. <laughs> Loan money to both sides, you win every time. Mussolini, the Italian dictator, was strongly influenced by the evolution philosophy. He thought the Italians were the superior race. <clears throat> in 1936, uh, Italy invaded uh, Ethiopia. They wanted to take over Ethiopia, Africa. They slaughtered them. Uh, here's the Ethiopians with their spears and their swords against the uh, Italians with tanks and airplanes. It was just a merciless slaughter. Uh, after all, they're just black, you know, they've got to be inferior. That's the thinking that was motivated by, or that was, that's the philosophy behind it, uh, Mussolini's thinking. Hitler <coughs> and Mussolini, of course, were uh, allies for some of the war until Mussolini lost. <coughs> Hitler thought the German race was superior and they deserved to rule the world. <coughs> Hitler said, by the way, Sir Arthur Keith is the same guy who wrote the book, he wrote the foreword to Darwin's book when it was republished. Darwin's 100-year anniversary book, the 1959 edition, which we have, Eric, they asked Arthur Keith to write the foreword to it because he was such a great famous evolutionist. Keith said, The German Fuhrer has consistently sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. All you need to do is read Hitler's book, uh, Mein Kampf, which I was reading right here, um, and you will see Hitler's racism all through this thing. It's really uh, pretty incredible. His philosophy really permeates just about every page of the book, his racist philosophy, thinking the German race is superior. It's pretty scary to read this, realizing how many people followed Hitler. And then, of course, what was the church doing? How could they fall for such a thing? Um, Marvin Lutzer, the president of Moody Bible Institute, has written a great book, Hitler's Cross. What was the church doing? Why didn't the church oppose Hitler? If the Christians just would have stood up against him, they could have, done, you know, could have stopped him. The church swallowed it, too. He goes through how the church was deceived. We'll get into more of that later. In Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, here on page 286, depending which edition you have, some editions it's other pages, but on page 286, Hitler said, No more than nature desires the mating of weaker with stronger individuals, even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Since if she did, her whole work of higher breeding over perhaps hundreds of thousands of years might be ruined with one blow. <clears throat> Historical experience offers countless proofs of this. It shows with terrifying clarity that in every mingling of Aryan blood with that of lower peoples, the result was the end of a cultured people. Hitler somehow really honestly thought that the Aryan race was superior. They were the cultured people of the world. And the best thing that could happen to the world would be to kill everybody else. To let the Aryans succeed okay, and take over. If you read this book, While Six Million Died... Um, this one. It absolutely will blow your mind of what, what, was the people, what were the people in the rest of the world doing. As I read this one, it just brought tears to my eyes over and over to realize how many people were duped by Hitler. In 1907, the United States had an immigration quota. Here's what this book says on page 133. Scientifically hazy theories of biological superiority and inferiority of various European races now began to dominate the formulation for immigration policy. In this atmosphere, the United States government appointed a nine-man immigration commission in 1907. After three years of work by a staff of 300 at a cost of a million dollars, back in 1907, that's a lot more money than it is now, the commission published a 42-volume report. This massive work supported the notion that Southern and Eastern Europeans were racially inferior to Northern and Western Europeans. So if you come from Southern or Eastern Europe, you're, they thought you were racially inferior. That was a $1 million study done by the United States government in 1907. So America was just as racist. In this book, on page uh, 204, 
It, it, they tell the story how Hitler offered to send the Jews to anybody who would take them. He said, okay, you think we're being mean to the Jews here? You want them? Hitler said, I'll pay for them to come to, you, come to your place. We'll send them on luxury ships. Roosevelt refused to allow them to come to America. The immigration quotas in America were such that, hey, we don't want any Jews. Uh, they let a few come in. But the problem was, you had to have $10,000 to come into America. Because they didn't want you to be a burden on the American uh, system. Hitler, though, said, you can leave Germany if you want, but you can only take $4 with you. Well, that's pretty rough to get start off with 4 bucks and end up with 10000 by the time you go on a two-week trip across the ocean. So they were just really stuck. They tell the story in here of the 900 and some Jews who run a boat that came to Havana, Cuba and begged to be released. They went into the harbor. Here they could see all their relatives, you know, please get, let them off the boat. This is before Cuba was communist, okay? Uh, please let them off the boat. Cuban officials refused. So they sailed up to Miami. They said, would you please let us come? They're killing the Jews over there in Germany. Miami officials said, no, you can't get off here. They sailed up and down the coast of the United States begging for asylum and were refused at every port in America. What happened to the Jews, you're not going to understand World War II until you understand while six million died, what were people thinking? Some people were thinking, well, they're inferior species. It goes right back to the evolution theory. When Jesse Owens won the Olympics, won I think seven gold medals, or nine gold medals, whatever it was, in 1936, Hitler walked out of the stadium. He said, it's unfair to make my men race against this animal. Jesse Owens said, I wasn't invited to shake hands with Hitler, but I wasn't invited to the White House to shake hands with the president either. He said, it's all right with me. I didn't go to Berlin to shake hands with him anyway. All I know is I'm here now and Hitler isn't. <laughs> Jesse Owens, the black American athlete. Um, Hitler's hit list, I discovered this when I was reading in uh, Keene State, New Hampshire. They've got a section of the library up there at the Keene State University that is uh, all books just about Hitler and the Holocaust. It's, it's the most incredible thing I've ever seen because I love to read about Hitler and the Holocaust, you know. they got this huge section of the library, all books about Hitler. So I went in there, had six hours to spare before my next meeting, you know, I had to speak somewhere at the church that evening. And uh, I asked, the li they've got a librarian just in charge of that section, or they did have it, I don't know if they still do. But I said, sir, why did Hitler kill the Jews? You know, why not somebody else? Well, he did kill a lot of people, but why did he hate the Jews so bad? For the next six hours, that guy brought me book after book after book. He said, oh, well, here, you can put, get it figured out from this and from this and from this. And we found Hitler's hit list. Why the Jews? You know, why not the Italians or the Spanish or the French? or Why Jews? Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordic, the Norwegians, uh, were close to pure Aryan. Make sure you take note of that. Blonde hair, blue-eyed. Norwegian, born in story tell dog, you know, ya sure, you betcha, oof da. And he thought the Germans were blue-eyed or brown-eyed, uh, that's less desirable. Blue eyes is the most desirable. Hey, they're most, mostly Aryan. It was a big deal in Germany to go around and check people's eyes to see what color they were. They had charts the doctors would use to see how much Aryan you were, what percentage Aryan. Uh, how many have seen that stuff before on TV, the kind of thing they did with the checking the eyes, even checking, they call it phrenology, I believe, measuring the dimensions of the skull, different thing, different direction, dimensions of the skull to find out how close to pure Aryan they were. He thought the Mediterraneans were slightly Aryan. The Slavic, half Aryan, half ape. Brother Pratsuk, you Slavic? Hitler thought you were half ape, half Aryan. He said the Orientals are slightly ape. The black Africans are mostly ape. And the Jews are close to pure ape. From the book Hitler Movement, page 107. The reason Hitler killed the Jews was because of his philosophy, his belief that they were an inferior species. And he thought, look, they're taking up valuable space that really belongs to the Germans. And as you read through his book, Mein Kampf, it's just scary to think that this guy thought this, okay? And then he hid behind the cloak of Christianity. He was a Catholic, uh, and he wanted people to think, well, I'm doing this in the name of God to you know, purify the race. Because some renegade Catholic priest back in 1912, I believe, wrote a book claiming that, uh, you know, that years ago there were just two races, the apes and the Aryans, and they intermingled. And now we have a whole range of people, everything from ape to Aryan and everything in between, and we need to just eliminate all these inferior half-breeds and allow only the Aryans to survive. Hitler read that, believed it, and acted it out. 
Probably 13 million people died because of World War II. Uh, Six million Jews were slaughtered in the camps. One of the Jewish uh, doctors who survived the Holocaust later said, there's a difference between those who look upon their fellow human beings as common creatures of a common creator and those who look upon them as a conglomerate of biologicals and chemicals. Powerful statement here. If you look at somebody else and say, wow, God made this person, that makes you think of him one way. If you look at him through the eyes of a person who believes in evolution, hey, they're nothing but chemicals that got together by chance. That's what evolution teaches. This doctor ought to know he was in the prison camp, okay? Now, the Jewish Talmud, this is something, Eric, you need to get down because the Jewish, uh, the, the Torah is the same Old Testament as we have. Okay. T-O-R-A-H, okay? Yeah, I, very, I don't know of any differences. There may be some little stuff, but very, very, very similar. The Talmud is a book of Jewish writers writing their ideas. It is not the Bible. So you've got to be real cautious if you get into a discussion, if you're talking about the Talmud, which is not good, or the Torah, which is perfectly fine. The Jewish Talmud uh, is, teaches that non-Jews are to be exterminated. See, they're just as racist as anybody else. They think they're superior. In the, the section of the Talmud called uh, Yabamoth 98a, it says, All Gentile children are animals. In the minor uh, tractus, uh, Sophrum 15, Rule 10, even the best of the Gentiles should all be killed. Nice guy, huh? Okay. You want to get the website hoffman-info.com. He's got a ton of stuff on the Talmud. I met him when I was out in, uh, speaking in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, out in that region. I don't think it's possible to fully comprehend what happened in World War II and what caused all this suffering until you see how evolution ties in. The more I read on Hitler, and I read a lot on Hitler just to keep my blood boiling, you know, and to try to understand why did he do this, the more it makes me angry that we are paying to have this same philosophy of evolution taught to our kids in this town today. They learned this. During World War II, <clears throat> I've had several people tell me this is true. I cannot document it. Uh, I'll just tell you what uh, Milton um, Cooper said in his book, which I have uh, in there, Behold a Pale Horse. He said, during World War II, a Polish salesman working for IG Farben Chemical Company by the way, IG Farben Chemical Company was tied in with Rockefeller over here in America. The Rockefeller Standard Oil. Chemical company, remember, love of money, root of all evil, okay? This guy, Polish salesman, sold cyanide gas, <coughs> Zyklon B, and Malathion to the Nazis to help exterminate the Jews at Auschwitz. After the war, he feared for his life, so he joined the Catholic Church and became a priest, 1946. In 1958, he was ordained as Poland's youngest bishop. After 30 days, the reigning pope was assassinated, and he became Pope John Paul II, the current pope right now. Interesting story. I want to get more documentation on that. Milton Cooper does a tremendous amount of research, and I know of no reason to doubt what he said, but so far I've been unable to prove this story is true, but it might be something you might want to watch for if you've seen it. That's the former cyanide salesman. What better place to hide than right out in the open? Um, as I study and read on what happened with uh, Hitler and the Holocaust, it, I, I'm constantly tying it in with why he did what he did. You know, what he did was horrible, but why? What would motivate a guy to do that? And I go back to his thinking. What you believe determines how you behave. When I read books like Peace Child and Eternity in Their Hearts, and Jan, have you read those missionary stories? Those natives over there in Papua New Guinea, you know, they teach their kids, now if you kill somebody in battle, be sure to cut off his head and eat the brains because you'll get his spirit. Well, of course, that's stupid, but if you tell that to a kid all his life when he's growing up, guess what he's going to do when he gets into battle? <laughs> People do some pretty dumb things because of what they believe. <clears throat> if you believe the Jews are inferior, they're just animals, and you're the superior, you know, Aryan race, well then, it's really best to eliminate them. That's what happened here, Hitler and the Holocaust. So as you read <coughs> stories on what happened, you better tie it in with evolution. I've been to Germany three times, uh, visited the Flossberg concentration camp. That's where they cut the stone out to make the big uh, theater at Nuremberg. And I stood there at the theater and just wept and cried as I walked around this massive stone theater. Here I'm walking on these stones, and I'd just been to the Flossberg concentration camp and seen the mine where the Jews 
Here they were, barely fed enough to stay alive. They have to work 12 hours a day carrying these huge granite slabs up and down these steps. And if you fall over, they shoot you and get another one. Because after all, they're bringing new ones in all the time. They worked them, literally, to death. That was the intention. Get as much work out of them as you could. Work them until they drop. And then bring in another one. Here's a pile of shoes from the victims of Hitler's uh, Holocaust. These are the dead bodies. They just dumped them into massive graves. Um, again, you ought to do that. I was, uh, this is a rally at Nuremberg. You can see the pulpit there where the man is standing on the bottom of the center of the picture. I stood there and looked out over this huge parade ground and this whole pulpit area is a long bleacher section all made out of granite by these Jewish slaves who died in the process of carrying these you know, granite slabs. They sawed them out of the ground, out of the granite mountain, sawed them into slabs, polished them, you know, transported them for Hitler to build this massive theater at Nuremberg. Hitler strove to do everything in huge, grand scale. As you stand there in that pulpit, you feel real tiny because this area is just massive, giant parade grounds. Hitler wanted to make the individual feel small and expendable, and the cause seem great. That same thing is going on today in our public schools with the environmental movement. You're just one little person, but look, we've got to save Mother Earth. The environment is so huge, and you're just so tiny, you're expendable. The cause is great. Same kind of mentality. You've got to watch for that. Hitler knew you have to indoctrinate the youth. <clears throat> he, he closed down Christian schools <clears throat> and began indoctrinating his youth with the uh, Aryan supremacy idea. Hitler kept referring to the Jews as a parasite in the body of nations. And what do you do with a parasite? You try to get rid of it. And he said, all oh, the Jews are parasites in his book, uh, Mein Kampf, right here. You can read it for yourself. He said, the Jews are just a parasite. It's interesting, the abortionists today refer to the unborn child as a parasite in the woman's body. Makes you wonder where they got that uh, mentality, huh? During the time Hitler was uh, in control, and even way before that, this was taught, it's still taught today, by the way, that the embryo growing in the, inside the mother has gill slits. It was a German professor, Ernst Haeckel, who made this up in 1869. This influenced the Germans. Uh, he traveled all over Germany and converted people to believing in evolution with his big charts. This led to the idea that if evolution is true, then, you know, one race must be superior. And obviously, you know, it's us. <laughs> That's kind of the way it ended up, you know. 19, uh, 1870, we had Otto von Bismarck. You know, the Bismarck was named after him. Otto von Bismarck started uh, the war, you know, to prove the Germans are superior. If you're going to have a contest to see who's superior, how do you, how do you decide? Well, you've got to fight it out. We do the same thing today in football, boxing, you know, who is superior? Let's duke it out and find out. Haeckel was a liar. Here are the drawings that he made on the top. Underneath are actual photographs of these creatures. We covered that in, you know, seminar part four. He was just flat a liar. But that had a strong influence on, and still does today. I read a letter to the editor yesterday in the, from the St. Louis uh, News Post-Dispatch where this medical doctor wrote in, and they asked me to comment on it because I do a, every morning, uh, every Wednesday morning, a radio station in St. Louis. I'm on the air at 720 uh, doing a call-in talk show. I have for a long time with Tim and Al's show, um, KJSL St. Louis. This doctor had written a letter, and they faxed it to me. And he said, we've got proof for evolution. The human embryo has gill slits. This guy's a medical doctor. He ought to know that was proven wrong in 1874. But he's still teaching it. Here, 2001, teaching people, yeah, we got proof for evolution because of the gill slits. I mean, talk about behind the times. Hey, it works. It makes kids believe in evolution. So go ahead and teach it. Hitler was talking to a man one time. This man said, you'll never get me to come into your camp. I'll never be a Nazi. Hitler responded, this new state will give its youth to no one, but will instead take youth and give to youth its own education and its own upbringing. Your child belongs to us already. What are you? He said, you'll pass. We've already got your children. And they did. They put the children in Hitler's training in the school system and made good Nazis out of them. And boy, by the end of the war, I mean, the 13-year-olds were going off to fight for the fatherland. They, were, they simply were not going to surrender. They'd been taught, hey, we're superior. We've got to win this war for the good of humanity. 
in Skokie, Illinois, which is a Chicago suburb, my brother Mark lived there for a while in Skokie, Illinois, <clears throat> in 1993, a man shot a doctor, a plastic surgeon, just shot him and killed him. He told the police <clears throat> he chose a plastic surgeon from the phone book and killed him because they, that is the hairdressers and people who make blue tinted contact lenses, are diluting the Aryan beauty. There is still today a very strong Nazi movement. The idea that the white race is superior, that's the basis behind the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. That's the basis behind the uh, shooting at Columbine High School. Those kids at Columbine were strong followers of Adolf Hitler. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose. It was to commemorate Hitler. They wanted to eliminate anybody that wasn't uh, up to what they thought was what they're supposed to be. They, were, they shot Cassie because she believed in God. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. That was straight from Hitler. Same kind of philosophy. This book we mentioned earlier, uh, Hitler's Cross by uh, Moody, Bible, Moody Press and Moody Bible Institute Chicago is really good, showing what were the Germans doing, or what were the German churches doing, Christians. Hitler used this as a propaganda picture. He's walking out of church. Notice the cross above his head. Hitler's propaganda minister was really good at making people believe, oh, Hitler's a good Christian guy. He's really trying to do what's best for our country. You know, we better follow him. They had Nazi baptisms. These pictures are all from this book right here. Okay. They had Nazi altars. Some churches even took their Bible off the pulpit and read from this book right here, Mein Kampf. Preaching German, you know, Aryan supremacy. Hitler said, if you tell the lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. And they're more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. <laughs> and boy, that's the truth too. Okay, so Nazism is founded solidly on the idea of evolution. Yeah, I don't think you're going to understand World War II until you put it all together and say that's what happened. We have plenty of books, Final Entries, 1945, The Black Angels, The Story of the Waffen SS. Anyway, let's take a little break. After the break, we'll talk more about uh, how evolution is the philosophy for the New World Order coming soon to a city near you. All right? Break time. We're going to talk now about how evolution, the idea that man is God, basically, which is what evolution boils down to. Satan said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, ye shall be as gods. This seems to be the primary philosophy and thinking that he is using to bring about what's going to be a one world government, commonly called a new world order. Satan, for all of his uh, time that he's been in existence, apparently, you know, except for the first maybe 100 years, Satan wants to be the ruler of the world. He wants to control this place. He wants it all to himself. He wants us gone because we're made in the image of God. He doesn't like us. We're not welcome here. The United Nations seems to be the primary key factor, key player now in the drive toward a one world government. Some of the goals of the United Nations, this was at the meeting held in September of 2000. They said, here's the goals, okay? We're going to establish a standing UN military force that can intervene in the internal events of any country. Steve, in the military, do you ever have to, do they have the military and Marines use United Nations patches or UN? Um, I believe so. I'm in a, I believe in you. Mm -hmm. You'll see that coming soon. That's why they're Velcroed on. You know, take off your patch, put a UN patch on. No, there's a, that big stinker a couple years ago about that. The one Michael knew. Yeah. yeah. He refused to wear the UN patch. He said, I'm a United States soldier, not a United Nations soldier. And one of the things that happened with Gulf War is uh, <clears throat> we kind of got used to the idea of the United Nations conducting wars. Same thing with the Korean War. Same thing with the Vietnam War. You know, this is supposed to be a United Nations doing this. Um, and it's just psychological conditioning of the people to accept the idea of the United Nations having an army. They want to eliminate the veto power held by the U.S. in the Security Council. This is their goals as of the year 2000. They want to give the United Nations jurisdiction over the Earth Commons. That means the United Nations, this is the goal that they want, the United Nations will have the authority to decide who, who gets to control the oceans, the minerals, the Earth's crust, the atmosphere, the airwaves, and etc. Everything. They will think they own and control and decide on the Earth. 
what's going to happen. They've already divided the Earth up into sections. Uh, we are in section six, uh, 54, 64. They know that American troops will not be likely to fire on American citizens. So they've already got the world divided up into sections where different troops will control different sections, like American troops will be over in Bosnia, while Russian troops are over here, just in case there's any, you know, problem, you send in the Russian troops. So it's, it's a good thing we've got a bunch of people on our staff that speak Russian, because they'll be in charge of uh, the, basically all of the southern United States, except for California area. The uh, uh, Belgians will have the central, north central United States, the troops from Venezuela will have the New England states. It's already divided up for, you know, who will be loyal to, who will not be loyal to those people, but will be loyal to the United Nations. This is the way it's going to work. They've been making plans for their new world order for many years. Satan has been making these plans. The Lord is in heaven laughing about it. <clears throat> we as Christians do not need to get nervous about this. We need to get busy. God is laughing. When you read Psalms chapter 2, the Lord said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? <clears throat> the kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together. Let's put UN in there. Against the Lord and against his anointed saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God is laughing at these plans for a new world order. Now, it's a little tougher to laugh on our perspective because we're going to have to go through some of these problems, but God is not nervous. And for his children, we should not be nervous either. At the UN Secretary General meeting uh, agenda for September 6, the year 2000, they said we want to give the UN the power to tax coming soon. Now you watch this. It will be able to tax fishing on the oceans, uh, particles being emitted into the atmosphere, extraction of minerals from the earth. You want to take some coal out of the ground? Sure, you just pay the United Nations a tax, because after all it belongs to them. That's their thinking. This power to tax the global commons will quickly make the UN more powerful than any country, including the US. This is all part of the plan. They want to grant the UN authority to regulate international commerce and they want to control food. <clears throat> right now, the last uh, I heard was like 95 to 97 percent of all food distribution in the world is controlled by ADM, Archer Daniel Midland Corporation, which is, I think, if I have all this straight, it's been a while since I put these details together, Prince uh, Philip of England is one of the key players in here. See, the English rulers in England, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Prince Philip, <clears throat> they think they are of the uh, Illuminati bloodlines. There's some good books if you want to get into more on that topic. The Illuminati, uh, the top thir 13 Illuminati bloodlines, they really think they're the superior, the superior ones, and these are the ones that over the last, over the centuries have been kings and queens and, you know, the rulers take counsel against the Lord. They really think they are superior for some reason, and they're going to find out Judgment Day that they're not, but meanwhile, they're pretty hard on everybody else down here, because they think, if you want to get more on that topic, read that book, but they think they're superior. Peter Singer, father of the animal rights movement, said, Christianity is our foe. If animal rights is to succeed, then we must destroy the Judeo-Christian religious tradition. The Christians are the enemy. We will not be welcome. You mentioned during the break that, you know, Hitler said the Jews are inferior, they need to be eliminated. It's just a simple matter of painting the Christians with that same brush, saying, well, these Christians are not going along with our plans for a new world order. We really need to eliminate them. We will become hunted. We'll be the enemy. We won't fit in to the new world order. The United Nations goal is to establish a new seat of power in the UN called the People's Assembly to consist not only of representatives from nations, but also of representatives from non-government organizations. The Secretary General and his allies can then decide which NGOs are rep represented and can thereby control the decisions made by the UN. Suppose there's 220 countries in the United Nations and they create 230 non-government organizations. Now you have majority vote. Simple. Create a new international court that will have jurisdiction over all nation states. This is the goal of the United Nations. Um, you need to read this book, and I brought several if you want to look at them. They're five bucks. It's Peter Kershaw, Hush Money. This is basically two chapters of his bigger book, which is much better, 
uh, if you want the, the whole story, in Caesar's Grip. Now we carry both of these in our bookstore uh, at less than the recommended price because we want people to get, I think this is five bucks and this one's 15. If you want to understand how the churches and, and people have been tricked into going along with the New World Order, these would be great books to get to comprehend what's happening. Oh man, what a long story. Um, churches, a hundred years ago or so, there weren't any, very, very, very few, incorporated churches. You want to start a church? You start a church. You don't ask anybody's permission. You just start one, okay? When I started this ministry, Creation Science Evangelism, we didn't ask anybody's permission. God wants us to do it. Okay, God, you, you own the world. You told me to do it. How much higher do I need to go for authority? <laughs> I don't need to get the government's authority for do something God told me to do. Now, in typical Caesar fashion, the government doesn't like that idea. They want everybody to get their permission. A true church, a real, honest-to-goodness, true biblical church, not a corporation of the government, cannot get building permits because that is subjecting God. The churches say, well, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Oh, yeah? Uh, you, you just, you're just saying that, okay? You don't really believe that. Our founding fathers would have turned over in their grave if, that, if they'd have thought that the government was going to tell the church, you've got to get our permission to build a building. They'd have started another revolution over that. And yet 99% of the churches in America are corporations because they somehow think they have to get that 501c3 status to be tax exempt because they think, goes back to the love of money, root of all evil, they think people will give more money to the church if they're 501c3. The truth of the matter is, most of the folks probably don't have to pay income tax anyway, but they're doing it. The church certainly does not have to have 501c3 status, and Peter Kershaw goes into all the details in here. Uh, his introductory statement, the whole parag first paragraph is from an IRS, uh, one of the rulers or leaders in the IRS who says, I don't know why the churches are getting incorporated, but as long as they want to, that's great. We'll be glad to take them under our authority. <laughs> that's basically what happens. A church can, we, we, we can give, if somebody wants a tax write-off, they can donate to our ministry, we can give them a receipt, and they can use it as a tax write-off. There's nothing wrong with that. Perfectly legal. But the last thing we're going to do is become a corporation. A 501c3 status would be the dumbest thing any ministry could do, in my opinion. Read this and then you'll agree with me, okay, if you see Peter Kershaw's uh, opinion here. This, though, is part of the plan to get the church under control of the government because they want to have a one world, uh, new world order. One world government with the United Nations in charge of everybody. So I'd recommend you read that. Congressman George Hansen from Idaho, in the foreword to this book, In Caesar's Grip, he said, it's impossible to have religious freedom in any nation where churches are licensed to the government. If your church government, is your church government licensed or your church 501c3 and, and or incorporated as a non-profit organization, that's exactly what it is. It's a corporation of the government. It's not a church anymore. You know, the IRS acknowledges that churches are automatically tax exempt and tax deductible without applying for 501c3 recognition. No church has to have this. Once they do, that puts them under the government, and now they've got all these rules and regulations. The way our founding fathers designed it in the Constitution was, you have the government, and they have their sphere of, sphere of influence, and the church is sovereign like uh, Mexico. We don't tell the Mexicans what to do, and the Mexicans don't tell us what to do. If a Mexican police officer showed up at the door and said, Steve, come with me, you're under arrest for driving too fast. Your question to him is, uh, sir, what authority do you have over me? He doesn't have jurisdiction, okay? It's a big deal in the military, you know, ju where's your jurisdiction end? The government has no jurisdiction over a church, none. Now, they do have jurisdiction over corporations. So if a church decides to become a corporation, well, now the government can tell them what to do. And the government can tell them, you have to hire so many gays on your staff, you have to hire so many whatever, they can, they can tell them that. And many churches are ranting and raving and complaining, saying the government has no business doing this, you know. Uh, D. James Kennedy, Coral Ridge Presbyterian, great godly man, but he doesn't understand this concept. Because he's out there saying, you know, the IRS is ruining churches, they're telling us you can't talk on these certain topics or you lose your 501c3 status. And the IRS has done that. If a church gets involved in politics, the IRS will say, look, if you talk on that topic, if you, if you get up in the pulpit and tell your people who to vote for, we're going to jerk your 501c3 status. 
Well, so? You don't need that 501c3 status anyway. But the pastor thinks he does to keep the offerings coming in. Love of money, root of all evil. And so this is hush money to keep the preachers quiet. That's what the purpose, that's why the title of the book and the guy with the tape over his mouth, hush money. Uh, keep the pastors quiet by controlling the money. And you ought to read both of those. Okay. Senator from Nebraska was involved in going after um, a preacher who had a Christian school without a license. Now, Everett Sullivan, who started this Christian school without Nebraska license, okay, and the state came after him. He said, we're, we're a church and we don't have, uh, you don't have any authority over us. The problem was his church was incorporated. Now, it took Sylvan some time in jail to, to, and finally a judge filled him in on what's happening. The judges, many of the judges know, fully understand this, okay? The average person does not. Sylvan, they said, Sylvan, you can't have a Christian school without a license. He said, I'm doing it because God told me to do it. Bless God, I'm standing my ground. And boy, the preachers all over America went to Nebraska and stood there in front of the church, you know, and locked arms, and the police came in and dragged him off and padlocked the doors. They took Sylvan out of the pulpit while he was preaching. Handcuffed him, led him out the door to jail. And everybody thought, wow, this is the end of the freedom of the church in America. No, it was the end of the freedom for your church when you became a corporation. It was your mistake. Lester Roloff, Remember Lester Roloff in Texas, Roloff Holmes? He spoke at our church in Texas the last Sunday before he was killed. Two days later, his airplane crashed. Lester Roloff had a great ministry at Corpus Christi, Texas. Okay, Roloff, Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises Incorporated. Well, he ran these homes for kids that were in trouble. You know, parents would send them down there, you know, please, you know, fix my kid. They're a rebel or whatever. And they did a great job of redeeming lives, you know, through scripture and hard work and stuff like that, and diet. Doing a great job. The state came in and said, we want to regulate your home. We want to tell you, you know, what you can do and what you can't do. Roloff said, you're not telling us what to do. We're a ministry of God. Uh, so they, they came in after and, and were shutting him down. And so Roloff reorganized and put his homes under a church, the People's Baptist Church of Corpus Christi, Incorporated. <laughs> stepped right back into the same trap and probably died never understanding what he did wrong. They're not going to tell you. You want to be incorporated? Sure, come on into our side. We'll be glad to have you. We'll be glad to have the revenue. So when I die, and Eric, if you take over this ministry, do not incorporate this thing, okay? You got it straight? Okay. Anyway, during the, tr during the uh, trial of this Pastor Elvert, Everett Sylvan in Nebraska, he was you know, on the radio saying, bless God, we're a church and the state's coming after the church. Well, he didn't understand. He wasn't a church. He thought he was, but he wasn't. He was a corporation. And the senator from Nebraska, who before that was the uh, um, Nebraska Board of Education member, and then later became senator, I believe, or maybe he was senator first. Anyway, his name is Peter Hoagland. He's on the radio debating with Everett Sullivan. And on the radio, Hoagland said, fundamentalist parents have no right to indoctrinate their children in their beliefs. We are preparing their children for the year 2000 in life in a global one world society, and those children will not fit in. Hmm. He knew as a senator, there are plans for a one world government. Just like Hitler prepared the kids for their one world government, you know, their... Uh, Third Reich, the thousand-year reign of the Aryan race. Hitler worked on preparing the children. There are people who want to prepare our children for a new world order. All over the United States, UN military equipment is already being spread out. The plans are being laid and implemented to have a one world government. They have portable detention camps. Pull up a truck, take off the camp, you have a prison anywhere. Have a riot in Pensacola? Too many people not taking the mark of the beast? Well, here, put them in prison. Um, we can talk for hours on this. Gary Fry, a friend of mine in North Carolina, is quite an expert on the New World Order. I pretty much speak on creation evolution, but since evolution ties into communism, socialism, Marxism, that's why we hit it in this part of our series. But Gary Fry, his website, youthofamerica.com, slash Gary Fry, uh, and his phone number is right there. He has great information if you want more 
on the uh, New World Order, the camps that are being set up, what's happening with the, the bombing of TWA 800 and who blew up Oklahoma City. Uh, all, <laughs> he's got tons of material on that. Very uh, good stuff. Get a hold of Gary if you want more on that. Okay. Um, let's see. They're putting lines in the highway uh, to count the traffic, of course, is the excuse. I talked to the guy from Perry, not Perry, Florida, uh, Crestview, Florida, who's doing the ones all over the state of Florida. He was contracted to cut, cut the grooves and put these lines in there. They put three number 14 wires in each slot, and he said, yeah, we can tell how fast the cars are going. We can tell what, basically what type of car it is by the length of the wheelbase. You know, the magnet picks up the first one and picks up the second one and calculates based on the speed and based on the time it took to go over the magnet. It's, you know, such and such. It's a, a bus or a truck or a car or whatever. Um, he did not know, but I've been told by reliable sources that three number 14 wires is sufficient to handle the charge, uh, the voltage, to have electromagnetic burst, EMF, electromagnetic Let's, no, there's another name for it. Atom what is it? EMP. Pulse. Pulse, okay. Atomic bombs do this. If an atomic bomb goes off overhead, it produces electromagnetic pulse that will, that will basically destroy computers within a certain effective radius. Just blow their brains out, okay? Almost all cars built after 1982 are electronic ignition, and a, a good EMP will shut them down. There's been research, and I've heard it's, it's in effect now, it's, it's cap available now, where you can simply have these, uh, like a radar gun, but you aim it at a car, and it will shut off electronic ignition. For catching speeding thieves will be the, you know, speeders will be the excuse. But uh, all they got to do is apply that same technology to those who are running from the New World Order. Shut down traffic, snarl traffic. Over to the side, we've got them all over Pensacola, these, you know, lines in the highway. Over to the side, you'll see on Interstate 10, there are several of them. And they're positioned in such a way that basically you don't think you could get around them. You've got to go over it. Uh, and my understanding is they're capable of shutting off electronic ignition cars. Now, one solution to this is take out your electronic ignition distributor and put in the old-fashioned distributor with points and plugs. And it's simple wiring. And now you have a, you don't get as good a gas mileage, maybe not quite the horsepower, but it'll keep running because it's not affected by the EMP. All over the United States, you see cameras going up. How many have seen those before? We've got them all over Pensacola here. Makes you wonder who's watching and why. What's going on? Of course, first you create a crisis, and then you bring in your solution. So they create a traffic problem. Well, we've got to watch the traffic flow here, you know. Now the police can respond more quickly if there's a traffic accident. We can see it. Well, it's true. They're probably using it for that. I don't question that. But... What other ulterior motive is there behind all this? You know, it always makes you wonder when the government gets involved. Um, United Nations uh, received a gift from the United from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, USSR, in 1959. Here, this guy is beating a sword into a plow. Now, what's the symbolism behind this? Do you think? Remember, the Bible says in the the when Jesus reigns, they're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Quit fighting, start farming. Let's get along, cooperate. This is just propaganda uh, to make them think, well, yeah, the Soviets want peace. Sure, they want a piece of North Korea. They want a piece of South Korea. They want a piece of North Vietnam. They want all the pieces is what they want. And their definition of peace is very simple. Absence of resistance. As long as nobody's fighting back, we'll have peace. That's what they think. United States Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers said, We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights or inalienable rights. Where do rights come from? They come from God. So why do we ask the government for permission to do things? If God tells us to have a church, why would we ask the government for permission to have a church? Like Peter Kershaw covers in his book, In Caesar's Grip. Any church that gets 501c3 incorporated does not understand what they have done. And we got a lot of these professional, you know, Christian church tax counselors that are out there telling, oh, you have to be 501c3. Well, just read this book first, and then you make your own intelligent, informed decision. Um, it goes back to the two basic philosophies of government. There's two basic philosophies of, of the whole world. There is a God, 
or there isn't. Boils down to that. If there is a God, then he tells us right and wrong. He tells us what to do. If there is no God, then we better get all the smart men together and we better decide what we think is right and wrong. Humanism. Two basic religions in the world. There's a God or man is God. Covered that before. That's what it boils down to. Now, if evolution is true and there is no supreme being, then laws come from man's opinion. People get together and vote on right and wrong. Rights are granted by the government. The government says you have the right to get married. You have the right to be born. In China, you can only have one, one child. You get pregnant again, they're going to force you to have an abortion. It's been going on for a long time in China. One child per family. Well, when you got married, Eric, we didn't get a marriage license. Got a marriage covenant. A legal marriage is you and your wife or husband sign the document and two witnesses. If it's in a family Bible, if it's a religious document, that's all that's necessary. Now, several times you've had hassles because of that. Because the banks are tied into this. Yeah, you know, everybody's tied in together with this plan for a one, toward a one world government. And a lot of Christians have been asleep thinking, well, you know, when they come knocking on my door to make me get one of these little microchips in my hand, they're not going to get me to put it in. You've already received a social security number. You're already doing 90% of your uh, transactions with credit. Yes, you'll receive one of these. It's just going to be a matter of you can't buy or sell till you have one. Simple. They're not going to force you to get it. You'll come ask them for it. Can I please have one? I'm hungry. I, I predict that's what will happen. If evolution is true, then the government should be the provider. This is where our welfare state comes in. It's called a democracy. Democracies are dangerous forms of government. I don't recommend anybody have a democracy. But here we got our people in America, and Bill Clinton, was big thing, his big thing was, we're going to spread democracy around the world. Any place the United Nations went in to establish a democratic government, it ended up with a communist government. That's really what they ended up with. If creation is true, then laws come from the Creator, and rights, you can't put a lien against them. They're unalienable or inalienable. You cannot put a lien against these rights. And government is limited. There are two legitimate functions of government. Punish evildoers and defense against outside invaders. You guys in the military, that's a legitimate function of government. The judicial system, punish evildoers, that's what they're supposed to do. Welfare, no. Government's got no business being involved in that. Education, no. Government simply has no business being involved in it. This uh, earthquake in Seattle, Washington, you know, destroyed a bunch of buildings. They declared a federal disaster area. Well, look, I think it's horrible. I mean, I got a brother and a sister living up there, okay? Yes, it's horrible what happened in Seattle, Washington. However, the government has no business being involved in taking money from people in Florida and sending it to Washington. Government's not supposed to do those kind of things. It's unconstitutional. But they've been doing it for 100 years and nobody stops them. Under a constitutional republic, the law is supreme because the law came from God. People got together, read God's laws, and said, okay, how does this apply to us today? And they made laws for their people in line with God's laws, basically the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. Okay, God says don't kill. All right, if you kill, here's what happens. God says don't steal. Okay, if you steal, here's what's going to happen. Here's the punishment, penalty. And one of the smartest things we could do in America would be to close down, just, just almost totally, but to close down the uh, uh, prisons. We don't need prisons. It's the dumbest thing you can do is pay $100,000 a year to keep some guy locked up. For certain crimes, he should be executed. For other crimes, he should pay back fourfold, like the Bible says. That would stop 90-some percent of the crime right there. Okay, my hobby horse. What happens, though, in our time we have remaining? They will create a crisis which will cause the people to accept more government intervention. When things are going wrong, people say, oh, government, save us. There's a great book called The Medusa File right here if you want to get more on some of the conspiracies of the past and things that have happened. Like what happened to all the American prisoners that the Japanese took? Why weren't they all returned? Many of those went into 
coal mines as slaves in Russia. The Japanese sold them, sold the prisoners. Vietnam War. GIs were captured, sent to North Vietnam, from there sent up to China as slaves into the labor camps. We go into North Vietnam looking for, where's all the missing, you know, POWs and MIAs? Oh, we don't have any, take a look. <laughs> yeah, they're up in China or Russia. Still, today. Great book, The Medusa File. The John Birch Society, they're now calling it uh, General Birch something or other, because the John Birch Society's got kind of a bad, because of all the media slurs, they've kind of, that name kind of comes across bad. I'm not a member of the John Birch Society. I'm not against it at all. Okay, I'm, in fact, I'm for it. But I just so tell folks now I'm not a member. John Birch was in China when the communists took over, and he was murdered by the Chinese communists. So to, to fight communism worldwide, the John Birch Society was started in his honor. And they still have active uh, groups all across the United States. Uh, Les Roberts, our friend here in Pensacola, is a member of the John Birch Society and is just loaded with information on you know, what's going on with communism and they're, sh they're still trying to get a one world government. And if you think the Berlin Wall came down because communism was defeated, boy, have you been duped. Uh, the Berlin Wall came down because it didn't need it anymore because there's just as much communism on the other side. Don't need that wall anymore. Get at the website cuttingedge.org for lots more information on this topic. Oh. There's a book called The Protocols of Zion. Now, there's a lot of controversy about this. And Eric, just because I mentioned this, you're going to probably take some flack because the Jews will get real upset about this. Apparently, what happened? This is the Hovind theory, okay? Some of the rich guys in the world who want to control the world um, created a plan of how to gain control of the world. They wanted to blame it on the Jews. So they wrote the book and called it Protocols of Zion for Jews. Some of the leaders of the New World Order are, are Jewish, okay, but I don't think all of them are, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, but the, the purpose was to write this book to tell everybody what's going to happen, and at the same time, protect yourself in case this book gets discovered by the wrong people. And sure enough, the wrong people have it. I have it. Uh, for, I'm definitely one of the wrong people. Never mind. Um, so the, if we can get you a copy of the Protocols of Zion, I've got it in my computer right here. I could call it up. It's like uh, 80 pages or something. So if we just simply print, or you can get it at any library, I think. Um, I, if our printing cost would be, well, Becca, you could run copies if somebody wants it. Let's sell it for five bucks. Huh? I can't hear you. Eight dollars. Okay, that would cover our running all the pages, 80 pages, stapling them together. Eight bucks if you want one of those or if you can get it at your library if you want. But um, here's a quote from the Protocols of Zion. Confirmation of Rathenau's statement came 20 years later in 1931 when, uh, whatever this guy's name, a prominent member of the Jewish uh, Alliance Israelite Universal wrote in his uh, Paris La Capitale des Religions, the meaning of the history of the last century is that 300 Jewish financiers, all masters of lodges, rule the world. Interesting. He's claiming here that 300 Jewish financiers that are masters of lodges, Masonic Lodge and stuff like that, are the ones who really rule the world. There's a book uh, called The Committee of 300. As you read the book, you'll say, wow, this is what's going on, huh? These are the guys who want to control the world and here's how they're going to do it. It's all spelled out right here. This, uh, did I put in the front cover where to get it? Dr. Lauren Coleman wrote the book. Let's see, Ocular Enhancers again. Um, you can write to WIR 2533 North Carson Street, Suite J 118, Carson City, Nevada, uh, 89706. Uh, Becky, make a note, if you would, for me to put that address on this uh, 5A slide 343. Okay, and it's off the back of the book. I'll put that on here so folks at home can, can watch that. If you want to get more about the Committee of 300, these are probably the ones who really ultimately make the decisions. That would trickle down to other groups that are involved in this, like the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, CFR. If you want to get more on the Council of Foreign Relations or uh, uh, 
some of those. You might want to get any of the books by Des Griffin. He's really good on this topic also. We sell this one, The Fourth Reich of the Rich, in our bookstore. You can get it. But he's written lots of other books like Descent into Slavery, Des Griffin. I think he's written four. Very knowledgeable on the topic of the New World Order if you want to get into that. So what they do, what the bad guys do, they create a crisis so that people will come along and ask the government, please help us, please do this for us. So they created the Depression, 1929, stock market crash, so that people would come ask the government, would you please take care of us, feed us? The government said, sure, sure, here, take this number. So Social Security was introduced in 1933 in the middle of the Great Depression. The Civil War was purposely created as part of the plan toward a one world government. So was World War I, so was World War II. The 1929 Depression, Churchill was brought into the visitor's gallery at the New York Stock Exchange to witness the stock market crash caused by the Federal Reserve. Yes? You mentioned that uh, the Civil War is Lincoln's war. Yes. Abraham Lincoln was a big player in this. Now, he had some very good qualities, okay? He did not claim to be a Christian. Matter of fact, he claimed not to be a Christian. Uh, one of the last entries in his diary was, you know, he said, I've been concerned about publicly professing my faith in Christ. I intend to go forward at the, I think it was Presbyterian Church this Sunday, and be baptized. That Thursday he was shot. So maybe later on he did, you know, become a Christian, but he was a player, probably unknowingly, to some degree, in the, the plans for the New World Order. He was the first, he issued the first executive order. There are now 13,000 of them, executive orders. First executive order, I think it was number one, was to send uh, UN, uh, federal troops to fight the Civil War. Is that why it's referred to as Lincoln's War? Lincoln's War. A um, lot of people were involved in this war, and it's really, like any conspiracy, it's really complex to figure out who did what. The Catholic Jesuits were very involved in starting this war, and they hated Lincoln. Okay? One of the problems was Lincoln was not going to go along with the Federal Reserve idea of letting the bankers control the, you know, the banks in America and control the, the money with the Federal Reserve system we now have. Lincoln issued greenbacks. Well, a greenback is a treasury note that is not, uh, there's no interest on it. So the bankers don't make any money. And they got upset about that. So there were a lot of folks uh, upset with Lincoln. The Catholics certainly wanted to kill him. The bankers certainly wanted to kill him. Uh, several people were after him. That's a big conspiracy. I'm not sure uh, of all the details on that, but there's good books on it. I'm sure um, Gary Fry would have something on that, or certainly uh, Des Griffin uh, would definitely know, or Bill Still would know that if you want to get a hold of them. The Cuban Missile Crisis is an example of the technique that they use. The communists have a technique. When you want to advance, you take two steps forward and one step back. And your enemy thinks, oh, he backed up. It's over. Well, yeah, he's one step closer. They wanted to get a military base in Cuba, right at the bottom of America, you know, 90 miles from Florida. So they brought in a military base and missiles. Kennedy huffed and puffed and had the big Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, and everybody was scared we're going to go World War III is going to start here, you know. And so after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, the communists took the missiles out of Cuba, we think. They had ships with missile shapes on them covered with tarps, and they allowed us to fly by and photograph them. Oh, yeah, you can build one of those out of wood, you know. <laughs> so we think they took the missiles out, I don't know. But uh, they kept the base. That's what they wanted. Two steps forward, one step back. Everybody in America said, oh, wow, they changed. We got rid of, well, we, we beat them that time, didn't we? <laughs> well, idiot, they beat you. Is that what happened? <laughs> okay. Oklahoma City bombing. Get the website, harvest-trust.org, or talk to Ben Parton. Now, Ben Parton, it was an explosives expert. I think he was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He did a great videotape with Gary Fry. There's Ben Parton's phone number right here. Ben Parton did a tape with Gary Fry on TV. Gary Fry's in North Carolina. You think you met him, didn't you? Okay. He said, look, folks, I'm an explosives expert. A truck bomb did not blow up the Oklahoma City building. Absolutely no possible way. That building was blown up from inside, probably C4, C4 explosives wrapped around the pillars. 
because an explosion in the truck is not going to knock all these pillars out. But there is still today uh, news media spin going on trying to convince the people that that bomb, the truck bomb, did it. Watch the footage we have. I think you've seen this, Eric, haven't you? Of the right after this happened, they're talking about. Now today they talk about this huge rider truck full of fertilizer that exploded and blew a big crater in the ground. Watch the footage. They're walking right up to the building. There's no crater in the ground. There never was. No nitrous oxide either. No residue of nitrates. Uh, there would have been poison gas from the explosion that knocked out people. And the people across the street, sitting in the restaurant, you know, broke a few windows. Why didn't it blow the wall out of that building? And pieces of the Muir building landed across the street. Uh, it blew out. It, blew out. <laughs> it didn't, blow, <laughs> didn't blow in. You don't need to be a genius to figure it out, okay? But you tell the lie long enough, the people believe it. And the poor victims of the Oklahoma City bombing are thinking this Timothy McVeigh did it and that guy ought to be hung, you know? Well, he might have been a, a patsy involved in this, but he, he didn't blow that building up. Okay, he's taking the blame for it. But that is not what happened. Call Ben, Ben, pardon, if you don't believe me, okay? Ask him. What was happening, one of the purposes of blowing up the building, there were several purposes apparently, was to get rid of a couple of agents who were not loyal, who were going to squeal on Bill Clinton apparently, about what happened at Waco. And they happened to be the only ones in the building who died. That morning at 8.05, I think, whatever time it was, you know, they were decided the uh, government agents are going to get in a bus and take a tour of Oklahoma City. Well, duh, they live in Oklahoma City. What if I got our staff together one morning, hey, we're going to tour Pensacola. <laughs> I live here, I don't want to tour Pensacola. Let's get to work, okay? So only those that were not loyal were left behind. And they happened to die. Same thing if you watch what happened at Waco, when the, you know, they climb up the ladder to the roof and the agents go in the door, in the window on the roof. A few minutes later, the other agent who's still out there throws in a hand grenade and starts shooting a machine gun into the same window. His guys are in there. Then you watch, and a few seconds later, you see apparently some of them survived. You see bullets come flying out through the wall. One of them bounces off the guy's helmet, and he slides down the ladder. <laughs> it was his guy shooting back at him. That wasn't the Branch Davidian shooting in there. The story apparently is that the guys that got killed at, at, uh, at Waco were, again, some people who were going to testify against Bill Clinton for some of the things they'd seen him do. I've got a list of 108, I believe. People, I'm sure because of this tape, people are going to ask for that list. So send a dollar or something, we'll mail you one. Becky, uh, remind me if you need that, the list of those who've been killed by Bill Clinton, top file drawer, about halfway back. Okay. Another, another purpose of blowing up the building was there was anti-terrorism legislation that had been stalled in Congress. Congress was not going to vote for this because it took away more rights of the people. They wanted to get this bill passed to prevent people from having machine guns, you know, Gradually choke down the system, or all you can have is a pea shooter or maybe a rubber band, no, you know, to defend yourself. Nobody's allowed to have guns. <laughs> and so they start off by banning, you know, assault rifles. Well, if you trust the government with assault rifles, but you don't trust honest Americans with assault, ri assault rifles, you've got you to screw loose in your head. Okay? So, and sure enough, it passed. The anti-terrorism passed after Oklahoma City bombing was blown up. TW-800 was also blown up intentionally, apparently to get rid of the three guys who were going to London to testify against Clinton because the local newspapers in America, the story goes, they wouldn't take their, wouldn't take their story. So these guys were all happened to be on one plane going to London. We're going to squeal on Bill Clinton. French Landsat satellite, one of the satellites uh, from France, has pictures of a missile hitting the plane. Now the poor victims are being fed this story about, oh, well, we don't know what happened. You know, maybe they blew up, you know. You know, a good way to get rid of somebody is blow up an airplane. You know, pretty hard to figure out what happened, especially when the government's the one doing the investigation of what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's try to get all the foxes together to try to figure out why the chickens are disappearing. <laughs> In the book, The Money Masters by Bill Still, uh, he quotes Dave Rockefeller as saying, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. Boy, that's the truth. They want us to accept, you know, uh, their, want, their plan, their ideas of a one world government. All they need is a good crisis. And what will happen is the president then has an excuse to declare martial law. And everybody's going to be governed by martial law. Lincoln issued the first one ordering troops into the war. 
Now there have been 13,000 executive orders. This bypasses Congress. If there's an emergency, you don't have time for everybody to vote on, you know, should we allow money, you know. Hey, there's a war going on. So they will declare war on anything. War on drugs. War on poverty. You've got to watch this rhetoric because they're saying these words. Well, I'm a president say, we're going to declare a war on drugs. Declaration of war abolishes the Constitution, sets him up where he can now, he's, he's dictator. He controls by executive orders. And that's what's been going on for the last hundred years. Lincoln started this whole concept. So these super rich, powerful uh, zillionaires, you know, that want to control the world in America and in Europe, are preparing the, for a war on the people, the, for anybody who will resist their plans. They want a one world government. They've been working on this for a long time. Here are some of the executive orders. We're out of time. Let's uh, start up next week more on uh, the new world order and how the evolution philosophy ties in. After all, if there's no God, man decides what's right and wrong. We decide, you know, what to do. And there's so much you can read. Now, let me encourage you. I don't want to leave you hanging with this, you know, I read a lot on the topic, okay? It's not time to get nervous. I, I, I understand some of what's going on. The Waco whitewash, what really happened at Waco. You want to read about the Waco, you know, how they covered up that story. Really what happened? You want to find out? Here you go. Churches getting incorporated. I go speak in churches that are incorporated just about every week of the year. You want to read about the Council of Foreign Relations, Shadows of Power by James Perloff. Tremendous book on Council of Foreign Relations and how they're, you know, controlling things, but or about the Committee of 300 and the Federal Reserve. And I know a, a good amount of this stuff, what's going on. I'm not nervous. I'm busy. This is the time to quit playing around. It doesn't, doesn't matter who wins the stupid bowl. Go get somebody saved. <laughs> and Satan has most of God's children distracted on things that just are not going to matter in a thousand years. We are wasting our time. That's why we work 100 hours a week around here in developing this ministry. We want to get people saved and get Christians fired up to go get other people saved. That's all that's going to matter. Satan is going to win in the short run. But God is laughing because he sees the bigger picture. Read the last chapter of Revelation. We win. Nothing to worry about. Okay, see you next week.